No, it's supposed to make me cry first thing. <laughs> good morning, good morning. <laughs> On this terrific Tuesday, I'm Elizabeth, and this is the Dream Big Today One Year Daily Bible Study. We read all the way through the Bible from beginning to end in a year's time. And oh my goodness, does it change us from the inside out. Mm, changes us for the better, transforms us. We renew our minds through reading God's word. Life gets easier. Life gets simpler. Yeah. Yeah. Hi, Rita. Good morning, Debbie. We've got Mama Mary on with us, and Michelle and Donna and Tom's at the table with us. Good morning. Hi, Jan. We've sure been praying, Jan. Hi, Lynn. Good to see you guys this morning. I am excited about the reading. Boy, am I excited about the reading. Excited at the way it tied together today as well. Hi, Debbie. Hi, Ann. Excited about our retreat coming up. October the 7th through the 9th. I think we've got a couple of spots. Um, if you've been praying about coming to one of our Dream Big Retreats, this might just be the one. You can get a hold of Don along. Good morning, Lori. Hi, hi, Judy. Good to see you guys. Having a meeting this evening at 7 p.m. Central Time with my Bible teachers, the ones that teach with me. I'm excited about getting together with them. It's on a Zoom meeting, but I'm still excited. <laughs> hmm. We are reading today Isaiah chapters 51 through 53. Oh, my goodness. My goodness. Mm -mm -mm -mm. Verse 1, listen to me, all who hope for deliverance. That doesn't get your attention. I want delivered. I'm just telling you, I want delivered. I still have things I want deliverance from. Verse four, listen to me, my people, hear me, Elizabeth, for my law will be proclaimed. Verse seven, listen to me, who know right from wrong, you who cherish my law in your hearts. Verse 12, I, yes, I am the one who comforts you. And experiencing that comfort in the last few days, I can tell you. Verse 17, the last sentence, you are my people. There's just no greater words. I'm his. I'm his and he is mine. Verse 21, but now listen to this. Hmm. Are we hearing a theme? One, two, three, four times without me going back and digging. I may have missed a few times. At least four times today he's telling to listen to this. 22, this is what the so sovereign Lord, your God and defender says. See, I've taken the terrible cup from your hands. You will drink no more of my fury. Right there. Now we are in the messianic portion of Isaiah. He is definitely prophesying about, about the coming of Jesus Christ, the birth of Jesus Christ. He is telling us today. He's saying it over and over again. Listen to me. Listen to me. That's God speaking to us. Listen to me. Listen. Listen, listen. You will drink no more of my fury. I, I, you know, I want more revelation, guys, of God's goodness. I want more revelation of what he did for me through the birth of his son. And how it changed everything. It's so easy when we read this whole book cover to cover. To get so caught up in the Old Testament stuff. And the Old Testament law. That it 
tempts us to let it permeate into our lives today, but we're new covenant believers. We live in the AD era after the death of Christ. He's telling us right now today. I mean, this is a turning point in today's readings. Today's readings is telling us of a turning point in all of the earth. This is what the sovereign Lord says, your God and defender says, see, I have taken the terrible cup from your hands, hands, you will drink no more of my fury. It doesn't say God doesn't have fury. It says that we will drink no more of his fury. Verse three, for this is what the Lord says. That's chapter 52, verse 3. For this is what the Lord says. And there's some beautiful passages in, in um, well, let me read verse 6 first. But I will reveal my name to my people, and they will come to know its power. Then at last they will recognize that I am the one who speaks to them. And then there's some beautiful passages from verse 7 through verse 13. Um, but I want to continue on the theme. Listen to me. Listen to me. You'll no longer drink from the cup of my fury. I will reveal myself to you. You will know it is me who's speaking to you. This is the voice of the one and only God speaking as we read his words written down through the prophet Isaiah. Make no mistake about it. And then I want to pick up in uh, chapter 53, verse 4. And I really, 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 in fact, I just pray, Father God, I just claim the atmosphere is holy right now. I, I command any resistance all across the world to the people hearing my voice today, <clears throat> that there'll be no distraction, there'll be no confusion, that it will be clear, crystal clear to us. The words you're speaking to us this day, this day, September the 27th of 2022, that we hear your voice, that we, we, we make a decision right now in the name of Jesus to listen, to listen, to your voice today. And that as we listen to these words that you loved us enough to write down for us, that we will be changed. And I thank you for that. In Jesus' name I pray. Chapter 52, verse 4. Yet it was our weaknesses he carried. It was Elizabeth's weakness that he carried. It was our sorrows that weighed him down. He cares when our hearts are broken. And we thought his troubles were a punishment from God, a punishment for his own sins. But he was pierced because Elizabeth was rebellious. He was pierced for our rebellion. He was crushed for my sins. He was beaten so we could be whole. I could spend a week just talking about that. He was beaten. So we could be made whole. He was whipped. So we could be healed. 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 By his stripes we are healed. This took place over 2,000 years ago. At the time Isaiah is prophesying. It had not yet taken place. It was something to be looked forward to in the future. We get to live in these words today. Healing is ours here today. Wholeness is ours 
here today. Deliverance is ours here today. I no longer have to let my weaknesses stop me because it's in my weakness that he's strong. He was whipped so we could be healed. He was whipped so we could be healed. He was crushed so we could be made whole. He was whipped so we could be healed. Healed, our minds healed, our emotions healed, our finances healed, our physical bodies healed. He was whipped so we could be healed. We don't get that. We don't get that. When a doctor says your diagnosis is, the first thought is, oh, no, 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 no. I am, he was beaten so I could be healed. Is that our first thought? Is that our last thought? He was beaten so we could be whole. He was whipped so we could be healed. All of us like sheep have strayed away. All of us have strayed away. Not one thing you say or do surprises him. He is not disappointed in you. He already knew you'd do it before you did it. He'd already knew you'd say it before you said it. All of us, like sheep, have strayed away. We have left God's path to follow our own. Yet the Lord laid down on him the sins of us all. Yet the Lord laid down on him the sins of us all. He bore all my sins. All doesn't leave out future sins. All doesn't leave out any of my past sins. All encompasses everything. All means all. In the Greek, in the Hebrew, in the Aramaic, it all means all. All. All your sins. He was oppressed and treated harshly. Here, uh, this is another topic that I could speak a month on. Yet he never said a word. Yet he never said a word. Why do I insist on thinking I have to defend myself? Why do I do that? He set the example for us. We read about it. In Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, they came at him and he didn't even answer their questions. He didn't have to respond. Why do you think you have to respond? When your spouse gets grumpy in the morning, why do you think you have to answer back? He didn't even respond. There was a lot more at stake for him than there has been for us. And yet he didn't say a word. He didn't say a word. He was led like a lamb to slaughter. And as a sheep is silent before the shears, he did not open his mouth unjustly condemned he was led away unjustly condemned he was led away in his silence in his silence that's what he did for us willingly he could have called 10,000 angels he could have called 10,000 angels He's God. He's God. Everything was at his disposal. Every weapon, every, everything was at his disposal. And yet he humbled himself and he allowed them to scorn him. They al he allowed them to spit on him. That he allowed them to lie about him without an answer. We break up whole families over the silliest, tiniest things. Lifelong friendships are broken because we let words divide us. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
And then that takes us to Ephesians chapter 5, verse 1. <laughs> You know, Isaiah is giving us a glimpse into Jesus, unlike any of the other scriptures do, into who is he. You know, in the beginning, I told you guys, I started reading a 365-day Bible. I had the desire in my heart to listen and to read, to know God's heart. I wanted to know who he is. Who I told God, I want to know your heart. I want to know what you really believe and think about things. And he said, if you want to know me, read my word. Read my word. If you want to know me, he wrote his heart down for us. And it's changed me. It's changed me these last 20 years. More than anything else in the whole world has touched me. This book has changed me. I'm at a place in my life at 62 years old that if I could only give all my loved ones one thing, I'd give them a Bible. If all I had left, I'd give them a Bible. I'd give them a daily Bible. I'd make it easier for him because it is easier by far to read this Bible than it is for me to sit down and start in Genesis and go all the way through. And I've done that. I've done that in just a what I would call a regular Bible. This makes it so much easier. And then we get to Ephesians 5 verse 1. Imitate God. The timing of that. The timing of those words right there coming off of Isaiah. What Jesus did for us. What Jesus did for me. And I'm to imitate him. Wow. Wow. I don't want to give 50 bucks to the beggar because he might go buy dope with it. Because he might go to a liquor store. I might be enabling him. <laughs> oh, the judgment that I walk in. Who am I to say? Who am I to say? The truth is the Holy Spirit will lead me. The, the Holy Spirit will tell me what to do and what not to do. I mess up when I get ahead of, of, of God. When I want to I want to play God by giving somebody 50 bucks that God didn't tell me to give them give to and then they go off and binge with it hmm. all, all we have to do is obey all we have to do is imitate God are we really there are we really there how easy it is for us to get so full of ourselves. Oh, oh, I'm this big Bible teacher. We, I, you know, we, we have 11 different countries that tune into our Bible study study. Um, they listen in. Oh, oh my goodness. I've given away. We've, we've given away hundreds of these Bibles. <laughs> All he really wants me to do is imitate him. And yet he was beaten so we could be healed. He was crushed. So we could may hope, be made whole. And, and I get offended. And I get offended. And I walk in a fence. Hmm. I hire somebody. And bring them into. The kingdom work that's being done here. And then I'm surprised when they steal from me. I'm surprised when they lie about me. Why, why would I be surprised? Did, 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 did I not read it? I mean, did you read that the way I read it this morning? Ephesians 5, verse 1. Does it not say, imitate God? Did it not say back in Isaiah, he was oppressed and treated harshly, yet he never said a word? 
They stole from him. In fact, one of his closest ones stole from him. Judas. He gave the money sack to Judas to take care of. He made him the accountant, knowing he was stealing. Knowing what he would do to him. He allowed him to betray him with a kiss. And yet we say we can't forgive adultery. Yet we say we can't forgive betrayal. We can't for Well, that's an unforgivable thing. No, I have to break off fellowship. Hmm. Hmm. Imitate God. Imitate God. Therefore, in everything you do, in everything you do, oh, Lord, I fall so short. But I refuse to look at the shortcomings. Because when I look at my shortcomings, my eyes are off of you. Imitate God, therefore, in everything you do, because you're as dear children. Live a life filled with love, following the example of of Christ. Following the example of Christ, he loved us and offered himself as a sacrifice for us, a pleasing aroma to God. Those are some of my favorite words in this whole book, a pleasing aroma to God. Our sacrifice is worth nothing if we don't do it with the right attitude. Our offerings mean nothing if we're giving because all we want to do is get. Our sacrifice, our offerings, our tithes, our work, our sweat, our toil, if it's not a pleasing aroma to him, it just means nothing. Let there be no sexual immorality. We, we could just put a period there. We don't have to name it. We don't have to get on a bandwagon over. I don't even want to name it. Let there be no sexual immorality, period. That's an act that he's condemning, not a person. Why do we condemn the people? Why is it that we have a church that for 25 years, They've been faithful. They've served at that church. They've been there. Scrubbing the toilets. Sweeping the floors. Paying for the meat for the dinners. Praying for people. Loving on people. Taking them into their homes. And the first time they fall and they have an affair, they ask them not to come back to the church anymore. Really? Really? The act. Let there be no sexual immorality. The act is condemned. The people should be loved through to deliverance. What did Jesus do to the woman who they caught in adultery? And they brought them to him at a time in history when adultery was dealt with stoning what did he do he knelt and didn't say a word and he drew in the dirt and then he said let he who is without sin cast the first stone I went to a church that that happened. There was a fall. There was an affair. And they were asked to leave the church. Really? Really? Why do I bring that up? To condemn that church? Nope. 
Nope. I bring it up to have us check what's in our heart. How do we treat those who have fallen? How do we treat those who need our mercy more than they need anything else? I bring it up because it says imitate God. Follow the example of Christ. Live a life filled with love. Love covers a multitude of sins. I bring it up because we live in a society that says, oh, they got a separate bank account from you? Divorce them. Oh, they've been, they've been lying. They've been cheating on you. Divorce them. Life's too short. Just get rid of them. I bring it up because God continually deals with me about my judgmental attitude. That's why I bring it up. When I'm walking in a judgmental attitude, whether it's about sexual immorality that's in the news, that's being forced down our throats, that's it's. <laughs> Live a life filled with love. Love isn't weak. Love covers a multitude of sins. It doesn't make sin okay. Because I want to be, I bring it up because I want to be a pleasing aroma to him. And as I read these words today, I was so thankful. I got to see his heart in a brand new way this morning. Instead, let there be thankfulness to God. Instead, let there be thankfulness to God. Don't be fooled by those who try to excuse the sins. For the anger of God will fall on, on all who disobey him. Don't participate in the things these people do. Do. For once you were full of darkness, Elizabeth. Once you were full of darkness, Elizabeth. But now you have light from the Lord. So live as people of light. For this light within you produces only what is good and right and true. Carefully determine what pre pleases the Lord. Take no part in the worthless deeds of evil and darkness. Instead, expose them. It is shameful even to talk about the things that ungodly people do in secret. But their evil intentions will be exposed. When the light shines on, when the, the okay, Verse 13, but their evil intentions will be exposed when the light shines on them, for the light makes everything visible. Verse 17, don't act thoughtlessly, but understand what the Lord wants you to do. Don't be drunk with wine, because that will ruin your life. Instead, be filled with the Holy Spirit. Verse 20, and give thanks for everything. To God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. And then he's going to really mess with our business. Starting in verse 21. And further submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. When I'm in the office and I'm making a statement. And somebody talks over the top of me. And they want to be right more than me. I submit. I don't have to be right all the time. I submit, we submit to one to another. Those are daily things that happen to us all the time. I've been guilty of talking over the top of them. And then they talk over the top of me and then I talk over the top of them and we've accomplished nothing. Submit to one another out of reverence of Christ. And then he goes right into the marriage. People don't like these words today. People don't like divine order. People don't like authority. But it is written. And it is written in New Testament, New Covenant, for our life today. 
He didn't ask us if we liked it. In fact, he wrote it down because he knew we wouldn't like it. He wrote it down because this is his heart. He wrote it down because he knew in our carnality, there would be times in my marriage when I absolutely positively think I'm right. And my husband absolutely positively thinks he's right. And we don't know what our next step is, except it is written that I, as the wife, will submit to my husband. Not because I'm giving in to a man. That has nothing to do with it. It is because I'm his. I'm his. He makes all things right for me. And further submit to one another out of the reverence for Christ. I love that he tells us that first. That comes first. And then for wives, this means submit to your husband as to the Lord. For a husband is the head of his wife as Christ is the head of the church. He is the savior of his body, the church. This is written by our creator, the one who created male and female, the one who created marriage, who loves marriage, who uses marriage to depict his relationship with us. That's how much he loves marriage. As a church submits to Christ, so you wives should submit to your husbands in everything. Oh, that word, everything. For husbands, this means love your wives, just as Christ loved the church. Well, how much does Christ love the church? Well, we just read about it. He was crushed. He was pierced. He was beaten. He was whipped. He gave up his life for her to make her holy and clean, washed by the cleansing of God's word. If all we're doing is criticizing and correcting each other, we're not doing what's written on this piece of paper. Where in this piece of paper does it say that my husband gets to correct me? Where on this piece of paper does it say that I'm supposed to correct my husband? He did this to present her to himself as a glorious church without a spot, or wrinkle, or any other blemish. A man's job is to create a safe environment for his wife. A safe place for her to seek God, for her to get her healing, for her to get her wholeness, for her to get her deliverance. A safe place. Instead, she will be holy and without fault. In the same way, husbands ought to love their wives as they love their own bodies. For a man who loves his wife actually shows love for himself. No one hates his own body, but feeds and cares for it, just as Christ cares for the church. And we are members of his body. As the scriptures say, a man leaves his father and mother and is joined to his wife. We do not have the right to interfere in our children's marriage. And the two are united into one. And then we're going to wrap it all up with these words. Are you ready? Are you ready for these words? See, I don't like to read line by line to you because I want you to read for yourself. But there are times when reading line by line, the power of our words, the power of the spoken word, death and life are in the power of the tongue. This is a great mystery, but it is an illustration of the way Christ and the church are one. And the two shall become one. What? What? God brings together, let no man pull asunder. Let no man separate what God puts together. If we're one, how can there be a divorce? How can there be a divorce if we're one? If we don't know where he begins and I end because we're so one. So again, I say, each man must love his wife as he loves himself and the wife must respect the husband. Does it say if he's earned respect? The world tells us respect is earned. That's not what my Bible says. 
it's a command to me to respect my husband. And when I'm rolling my eyes at him and when I'm sighing when he speaks and when I turn my shoulder when he's trying to get my attention, I'm not respecting him. Guilty. I've been guilty of all of that. In Proverbs 24, 7, wisdom is too lofty for fools. Among leaders at the city gate, they have nothing to say. Mm. <laughs> Man, these words just, I, I can't find the words to tell you what these words did to me this morning. And I'm believing that it's transforming my mind, that I'm learning more and more about who he is, about his heart, and that his heart is becoming my heart, and my heart is becoming his heart, and that the true marriage is deepened every single time I pick up this book, and I read, and I read, and I read. Happy to see my mama on with me today. Hi, mom. I did see you. Come on. Hi, Nancy. Oh, our Nancys are on there. Before we end, if you don't know Jesus Christ as your savior, it's so simple. We make it we make it complicated. It's so simple. If you don't know that you know that you know that if this is your last day on earth that you'll wake up in heaven in glory in the arms of Jesus and I want you to say this prayer with me. It's so simple. All you have to do is believe that he is the son of God that he died for our sins and he rose again, that the words on this piece of paper are true. All you have to do is believe he is who he says he is. So with that, say this prayer with me. Father God, I come before you today wanting to know true salvation. I want you to save me. Forgive me of my sins. I confess that I've sinned. I want your forgiveness. I accept your forgiveness. I receive your forgiveness. Today I choose Jesus. Today I choose to make you the Lord of my life. Thank you, Jesus, for adopting me. Thank you for bringing me into the family. Thank you for saving me. Thank you for giving me eternal life in you. Today, I believe. And today, I receive my salvation. And it's in Christ I pray. Amen. It is that simple. It is that simple. I see somebody on the video with us named Stacy Moore. Oh, brand new Mrs. Stacy Moore. Congratulations on your wedding, Stacy. It was beautiful. I love you guys. Have a terrific Tuesday.